Um, when we think about innovation in energy, we like to think about alternatives. But over the last 10 years, we've had equally impressive innovation in conventional fuels, um, oil, gas. And what we want to talk about today is innovations that relate to natural gas that's been extracted from shale. Um, the amount of natural gas reserves in the United States has more than doubled over the last five years. And that's having a profound effect on gas markets, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. And um, as some of us know, Exxon has recently taken over, or will be um, taking over XTO and trying to bring that technology to Europe and other places as well. So this is going to have a, a massive effect on um, world gas markets and world en energy markets in general. Um, today we've got a, a very distinguished panel of people that are going to talk about these issues um, from a number of different perspectives. And what I'd like to do is start by um, moving down the panel and having you guys just very briefly introduce yourselves. And then we're going to have Tad talk for five minutes about um, unconventional natural gas, and then we'll move on to discussion. Um, maybe starting with you, Tad. My name is Ted Patek. I'm the chairman of the Petroleum Engineering Department here, and I will be the first speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Sampath Prakash. I lead uh, Deloitte's oil and gas consulting practice in the US. Um, my name is Marion Sabagian. I manage public policy issues for ConocoPhillips. Greg Trimble, I'm with Walmart. Uh, I work in their energy and carbon space. Sean Colossa, I'm in uh, pipeline financial planning and analysis for El Paso Corporation on the pipeline side. Okay, so we're going to start with Tad, and um, Tad's going to give us sort of a big picture overview on what is going on, on in unconventional natural gas. I got five minutes to, to describe the world, which is not a lot of time. Uh, I'll start from this beautiful uh, gas compressor, which is actually run on natural gas, and literally thousands of these things will have to be installed in different places. Um, I'll, I'll start from a little bit more general picture for your benefit. So there's a lot of talk about the US energy independence, uh, but the fact of the matter is that fossil fuels run about 85% of the US economy directly, and the remainder, including all the renewables, uh, has a variable but high, possibly very high fossil fuel content. Now, electricity is produced almost entirely from domestic fuels. That's a very important point to make. And natural gas, of course, is the swing fuel for electricity generation for a variety of reasons that we'll discuss later. Natural gas could aid greatly in the electrification of railroads and also in uh, the recharging of all these uh, EV vehicles that Stefan uh, talked about uh, during lunch. And of course, uh, natural gas could also supplement petroleum uh, as an automotive fuel directly. Now, <coughs> I will use some units. I'm an engineer after all. And, and the unit uh, that I will use is one exajoule, and that's the amount of energy that will feed 300 million Americans for one year. So if you eat one exajoule, the whole nation will be fed. So that's the minimum amount of energy we need to live and prosper and grow sideways. Um, so currently we use 105 times more than that in the United States. And if we were to digest that amount of energy, each one of us would be a male sperm whale weighing 40 tons and taller than this building. Now, one exajoule per year also happens to be one trillion standard cubic feet, which is the unit that the gas industry uses. And it also happens to be equal about one half million barrels of oil per day. So I will start from the two largest, well, we actually, and stop, two largest sectors of the US economy. Electricity generation, which uh, currently uses about 40 exajoules of primary energy of fuels to generate heat uh, per year. And it's the single largest sector of the US economy. And I will tell you how many days per year are driven by which source of electricity. So over the last 20 years, coal has driven uh, between 200 and now 176 days of electricity. Natural gas has increased rather uh, considerably, now could run 79 days of electricity supply in the US. Nuclear stayed pretty constant over the last 20 years, about 72 days of electricity supply. Hydroelectric has diminished because of silting out of dams, 23 days. And the rest is this little uh, 
band up there, I will not spend any time on it, four days out of petroleum, five days out of biofuels, wood mostly for biomass, five days currently out of wind turbines, an entire one hour of photovoltaic and uh, solar thermal. Um, now, when it comes to the second largest sector of the US economy, again, these are days on, f on fuel, that's a third of our energy use. As you see, gasoline has run this economy pretty much solidly for the last 60 years now, uh, and runs currently about 202 days of it. Distilled oil, mostly diesel fuel, about 100 days. Uh, aviation fuels, now almost entirely jet fuel, another 38 days. Uh, residual oil used to be uh, uh, burned in power stations, now it's mostly ships, 18 days. And of course, all ethanol drives it for an entire eight days. Now, natural gas, of course, as I just told you, will play an important role in, for us having some sort of an independence in energy supply, and it's the only large-scale clean domestic fossil fuel in the US portfolio. And I maintain that natural gas can easily generate about two out of existing 15 exajoules per year of electricity, so add another four to nine TCF per year of natural gas, and could actually displace between one and two million barrels of oil of motor gasoline. And of course, the key here, and it was also uh, covered by Stefan uh, during lunch, is not only stable prices, but also soundness, environmental soundness of field operations, and water processing, water reuse, is an extremely important element of it. Now, I don't need to tell you that natural gas in terms of kilograms of CO2 per giga gigajoule in fuel is the most efficient fuel at only 56 kilograms per gigajoule emitted as compared to hard coal at around 100 kilograms. So once you use natural gas, it will actually clean up your air quite considerably. Some people say not enough. Um, but it also means uh, cleaner soil and water. And that's not something that is readily understood by most people. What you see there is the largest environmental disaster in the last century probably industrial disaster, and this is the Tennessee Vial Authority caller spill, which will probably cost over a billion dollars to ultimately clean up in another 20 years or so. And, it, and when one adds up to that, that coal generates roughly, after capture, 100 times more mercury than natural gas, and that commercial boilers emit another probably 10 tons of mercury into the air. When you, say, when you see that coal also generates, you know, different people will tell you different numbers, around 300 million tons of ash per year, which is then stored at 570 large sites, each one of which pollutes groundwater and uh, soil. And of course, scrubbing the coal gas, flue gas, um, moves pollution from the air to the water, which is a very significant problem in eastern United States. So natural gas has a few uh, advantages here. The other advantage that natural gas has is that, especially the now the unconventional one, I won't have time to tell you about all kinds of gas, <laughs> um, it, that it's spread geographically almost all over the United States. Some of the biggest unconventional resources are in Texas, but a lot of it is going east and then north, uh, towards the northeast. So what you need to remember is that there will be a lot of players in this game once these resources get developed. Um, now, gas flows, it's a complicated picture. I just wanted to show you is that there's a huge network of pipelines in existence. And the thickness of each of these pipes, so to speak, is the amount of gas flowing. If you look at the thickest one in the nation, in Northern America, it emanates from Texas and Louisiana, and it goes mostly northeast. So Texas and Louisiana are responsible for supplying majority of gas in the United States. Now, if you were to discover a Prudhoe or a tenth of a Prudhoe, it would be front page news. Now, we have put online an equivalent of one, two, and two, that's four Prudhoe equivalents in terms of energy, as certainly proven reserves in unconventional gas. That's what we can produce today, no questions asked. 
if we want to feel lucky, we're going to put another one, two, and three, and that's another five Prudhoe base in things that we're not quite certain that we can produce, but it's quite likely. So it's between five and nine Prudhoe base equivalent in energy, or one to two gawars. Gawar is, of course, the largest oil field on the planet, and Prudhoe Bay is the largest oil field in Northern America. This should be front page news. Well, it isn't. Um, now for Texas, Texas produces about a fifth of US oil, about a quarter of natural gas, which over 60% of which is now unconventional. Texas also produces enhanced oil recovery oil, which is you know, about an eighth of the US oil. But the interesting point I want to make is that everybody thinks of Texas as an oil state. Well, Texas produces now four times more energy as natural gas and liquids than as oil. That's something that everybody needs to remember. And of course, I'm running out of time, but Texas produces also 21 times more energy as natural gas and liquids than as EOR oil. And of course, being a professor, <laughs> I will always make a pitch. And so what we're looking at is at a campus-wide initiative that should be $100 million plus that will put UT as the place to go for issues related to natural gas. Just uh, another thing that I wanted to tell you, so now I'm back to my exodus per year. The unit is here, 25. In 1973, when oil and gas peaked, that was at about 25 exajoules. Uh, and right now, we have another uh, Hubbard peak, which is mostly unconventional gas. All of these peaks are offshore, but now unconventional. What I'm telling you is that with all these resources, we can actually create another peak that will not look like this one. My ability to predict future is actually quite limited. <laughs> but I'm just, but I'm just uh, will let you know that that is a 100-year supply of gas in the United States. And we are ready to make it put in place. And if you look at the difference between cumulative gas produced from the basic Hubbard cycle and what I think we might, uh, that difference might be something like $10 trillion at the current $3.6 uh, of the current CFO gas. Of course, the price of gas is going to go up very substantially. So that's going to be, you know, probably $10, $20, $30 trillion just in gas. That's something not to sneeze about, and Stefan alluded to this. There's a lot higher uh, market capitalization and requirements of capital, and the game is just big. And just to finish as a UT professor, um, I will tell you that we do a lot of things in natural gas. Uh, we probably do more research on unconventional natural gas than any other university of, in the world already. The Bureau of Economic Geology and Jackson School of Geosciences, anybody from there here? Oh, that's a sh oh yes, okay, well, uh, that's a shame. Because they also have field research which is second to none uh, you know, in, in terms of their ability to do great things in the field. Uh, my department happens to be the best in the nation, and that's not my <laughs> words. Uh, and then, of course, Ray is here, and he is the first one to tell you that he's going to coordinate all these wonderful things that we're going to do here and provide a face for the university to the outside world. And, of course, I'm here at the McCombs School of Business, and I think I don't need to tell you that you are working on this as well. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, I think um, Tad did a great job of um, basically telling the story that we've got a lot of unconventional gas out there. We've got people in the audience who've worked on both the shale gas as well as um, conventional gas. And I, I, um, Tad or whoever on the panel, is the cost of extracting the shale gas considerably more expensive than the conventional? Well, the short answer, yes, it is. Uh, but uh, so, well, and, and I will be followed up by, by others. Uh, th th there's a lot of upfront cost, and there's very quickly declining production, which adds to our ability to, uh, to withstand very low uh, prices of gas. Mm -hmm. 360 or $4 is kind of on the low side for unconventional gas. Okay. But I think it's kind of on the low side for everybody producing gas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so for all the gas producers, $4 is too low, Sam Pat, to you? From your clients? Yes, <clears throat> well, some of the research that is out there, um, whether it's from the analyst community or from people like Harold, as well as data that we put together, uh, suggests that the kind of viable range for gas, all gas now, would be somewhere between three and a half and six and a half, just, you know, 
would be a, a spectrum. <clears throat> so depending on where people have their assets and, and where they, or, or how well they've deployed their, uh, their investments, um, <clears throat> there's some data to suggest that there are some um, basins which are on the lower end of that spectrum. And so people who have a concentration in that would be viable, let's say, at, at 4 or 450 and would be okay. Um, <clears throat> we certainly have seen some costs as high as 9, uh, and it's fair to say that that's more CBM um, type, type production. Cold but methane. So, yes, thank you. Um, so, so there then the question, the fundamental question is if the, um, if the industry doesn't believe that the price levels will come back to, say, $10 then those assets are fundamentally uh, going to be stressed for a period of time. So what we're seeing is, is not only uh, R&D and development in terms of uh, cost, taking down cost, but also in rebalancing uh, portfolios and trying to get a more balanced mix uh, so that there's more of a, a balance in terms of the weighted balance of the cost of gas. Okay. Amir Chad. If I may add something, because this is relevant in relative to oil, gas now costs about a third <coughs> per unit of energy. And that is not normal worldwide, where gas costs about the same amount of money per unit of energy as oil. That unusually cheap gas in the United States, which is mostly due to overproduction by the little guys who ventured and who did great things and pushed technology while the big guys were waiting, um, in fact, that's going to have to be equilibrated, and, and the, the price of gas will have to go up in the United States. Okay, I have a comment to yeah, make on it. I think that one thing probably to recognize in that and is um, gas here in the U.S. The U.S. has become the world's largest natural gas producer and surpassed Russia recently mm -hmm. on natural gas production. And so it is more or less at this time, and probably for a while, will be a domestic resource. Mm -hmm. And in that way, it doesn't get tied to a global number, the way that oil, by contrast, is much more global in nature. And so that's why it ties to that higher global price. And gas, at least at this time in the US, is, is a domestically fielded number. And that, that makes a difference. And then I, one thing I wanted to mention on what you were saying, Sam's had about the Na um, about natural gas price and that there will be a rationalization of portfolios and I think mm -hmm. uh, we generally would agree with that too. There is, um, within those higher cost portfolios, I think it's not that everybody's going to run out and only produce shale gas because that's the Absolutely cheapest. Not. There mm -hmm. is, um, because you have limits in different areas, for instance, service industry ability or infrastructure ability. So all of these things come in to decide, um, you know, what is that right. range of that portfolio? And so some of the mm -hmm. higher, a lot of the higher price stuff will still get produced and it'll just set the marginal cost for gas. The shale gas guy will make more on his right. investment, right? So. But we're not going, going to see people produce gas that costs $7 if the price is at $5. So, so we're seeing that being shut in, aren't we? Um, well, I, I think you're seeing still a range of gas production. It depends on the area. I, I think part of that has to do with hedge positions too. Yeah. Uh, I think you look at you know, various producers that may have hedged gas at prices that are significantly above cash at this point. Okay. And so as those hedge positions roll off, I think then you might see more of a, uh, a response. Okay, as a technical question, um, it's very difficult to drill an oil well and then basically cap the well when prices are um, low and then you know let the oil flow later when the prices are high. For natural gas, can I time um, my gas so that I produce it when the price is high and shut it in when the price is low? Well, go with one. Right. <clears throat> so probably it's easier than for an oil well, but this is not how you would run the business. Mm -hmm. And so, so essentially, especially in these new wells, you come with a very high production for a short time, you know, for two, three, five months. So the, the level high production is kept by constantly drilling new wells and having a coordinated drilling program. What happened in response to the low uh, gas price, half of the drilling has disappeared. That's half of the rigs in, in Texas were put uh, out of commission. Now they're coming back, but a lot of them are coming back in the oil, for the oil industry, right. the oil part of the oil and gas industry, not gas. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is that, for example, the Barnett Shale has a local peak now. 
And so if we do not continue to drill in the Barnett Shale, it's not going to produce what we think, the 26 TCF, trillions of cubic standard feet, uh, which is the popular estimate. It's going to produce 10. And so the, the gas price, the pace of drilling, have, uh, are completely linked to one another and can maintain a stable gas supply. But right now, that's not being achieved. So. <clears throat> Okay, I want to get back to the subject of innovation. Um, and one thing, correct me if I'm wrong, but to me it seems like the innovation in natural gas drilling has come from small entrepreneurial firms, not from the um, large integrated oil companies. So maybe I'll go to Sam Pat. Some of your clients are some of those smaller innovative companies, and, and maybe um, Mary Ann, um, talking from the perspective of the integrated oil companies, why is it that we have saw most of the innovation coming from the smaller companies in terms of um, the shale drilling? So I think I would frame it in two parts. I think the, uh, if we want to call it the innovation in terms of entrepreneurial zeal mm -hmm. and agility to move and the ability to, to seize an opportunity quickly and, 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 and deploy uh, resources against it, that level of agility is certainly uh, has been stronger with the smaller companies. Right. So we've seen people like XTO, which is which is uh, now uh, being acquired by or has been acquired by ExxonMobil, as well as Chesapeake and people like that, doing some very uh, agile moves in terms of acquiring land, mm -hmm. which really is is the game first, as you acquire the leases and then you can start to go from there. So their ability to to quickly make a decision and place a bet, and it's it's a small number of people. It's a different governance model. Right. Lends, lends, uh, you know, the, the, the organizational ability lends itself to doing that kind of thing. If we look at technology, then, then some of the, the super majors certainly have some very uh, significant technology there. I mean, Exxon has uh, a thing called Unzip technology for, for gas. Shale, uh, mm -hmm. Shell and, and Conoco have some technologies. So it's, it's probably fair to say that the super majors or the large companies have done probably very well on the R&D side. The smaller guys have been much more nimble in terms of getting to, to the resource um, and, and beginning to extract it, and, and there's probably a play there. Did Mariam, you wanted to? Um, well, I think I've got a few thoughts, and I agree with everything you said. I, um, one is I think it matters a little bit how you cut the pie in making the, the definitions. There's mm -hmm. a lot of excitement about shale gas, and rightfully so, because it's been such a game changer. If you cut the pie instead, at least from my own company's perspective, between conventional and unconventional, so that you start bringing in coal bed methane and talking about tight gas, um, the major integrated oils actually have been tremendous in moving the needle on bringing what were pipe dream type resources and making them to market resources that that the coal bed methane, for example, has been the thing that it was otherwise replacing the declining conventional production through the 90s. <clears throat> um, and then I think that there's also an important distinction to be made between the difference of the business model of the independents and um, the majors. Histor uh, over time, the major integrated oil companies started to go overseas looking for energy resource because there was opportunities there. And the folks that were here were these independent producers. I mean, they claim about 80, 80 to 90 percent of the wells drilled and more than 60 percent of the domestic oil production and I think a little more than that of our domestic natural gas production. At the end of the day, they were the guys that were here. I think what you're seeing now is a change because in 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, the major integrated oil companies had access to most of the resource around the world. And now if you actually look at the numbers, integrated oil companies have access to only 7%, full access to 7% 7, 7 of the reserves in the world. And so you're seeing this coming back to North America, not just the um, Exxon deal with XTO, but you're seeing BP come back here. And some of the national oil companies that we can't get our foot mm -hmm. into their door, but right. Stat Oil is coming over here. And Total, uh, Total and Eni, all of these guys are coming back this way because it's just a um, 
It's, it's, it's trying to get That's access to resource. Is it that they're trying to get access to the resources or trying to get access to the technology? If I think that I'm going to be drilling in Eastern Europe in the future, I want to learn how to do it. I and think I want it's to both. It's both. I think mm -hmm. it's both. Mm -hmm. I think it's access to the resource and the technology, know how to do it, because that's where all the excitement is now, is everybody saying, okay, now let's do this in Europe, right? right? You know, and Exxon right. has already moved in Europe, and ConocoPhillips has. We've acquired a big play in Poland. And, so. and I hear about Europe a lot, like Africa, um, China. Is there um, shale gas in these other regions as well? Do so, you know, Tad? <clears throat> well, well, oh, no, no, go ahead. No. Yeah, it's everywhere. <laughs> so, so, that's a short so the bottom line is this is a worldwide play that's going to change yes. basically how we think about energy. And I, I'd like to uh, move to Greg for just a second. Um, as our energy consumer, I know that Walmart um, is probably the largest energy consumer in the world. And I, I guess the question that I'd like to raise is that um, we've got innovation here. Um, in the production of natural gas, and in some sense, I don't know exactly the numbers, but let's say that we've got two times, maybe three times as much natural gas as we thought we had. Um, Tad's made a good point that um, it's not just that we have more natural gas, but if you look at natural gas relative to alternatives like coal, um, it's cleaner in a lot of ways. Um, it seems like a good product in that sense. Is that leading us to think about consumption in a different way? So I wanted to just ask Greg, as um, our b the biggest consumer on the panel, um, how does that, how, how does Walmart think field? about that? How, 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 e e e how many e-jewels do you consume? Uh, <laughs> I can't tell you that, but I can tell you that uh, we consume about one half of one percent of all the electricity produced in the U.S. Oh, wow. So it's, it's, a, it's a good chunk, and, and so as, as natural gas might translate into electricity generation, it certainly would be a part of that. But um, I think what, what you're asking maybe is, is what other ways might we be consuming natural gas. And so yeah. there's, there's at least two things that I'm aware of that, that we're doing. Uh, we're testing fuel cells, and uh, so far that uh, has been successful. We've got uh, two sites installed producing about two-thirds to three-quarters of uh, super centers. Uh, electricity requirements. The the kicker on that though is that uh, to make it pencil, you have to take advantage of the utility incentives or the the federal uh, tax breaks. And in order to do that, you have to have an element of renewable attached to it. So uh, basically, you have to have biogas instead of straight up natural gas at at this point uh, to make them work. Uh, from a finance uh, perspective. They work fine physically. Uh, they're reliable, and, and there is an element of being able to unhook from the grid if you need to, uh, but we haven't chosen to do that yet. Uh, the other thing we're testing is uh, natural gas fuel transportation uh, in, our, in our trucks. So we've got four Class A rigs on the road, uh, and we've got uh, one uh, yard machine that, that shuttles the uh, trailers around. So, and, and again, this is, the third time we've actually tested that. I didn't know that until recently. But we've looked at it a couple of times and we still have some of the, the same issues that we've, we've always had. Uh, infrastructure is, is not there. The retrofit costs are uh, prohibitive or, or at least on the high side. So, you know, we've got to bring those costs, natural gas costs down to, to make uh, that work. Okay, does anyone on the panel um, have a view on Natural gas vehicles. Um, I guess a year or two ago, Boone Pickens and um, Audrey from Chesapeake, they were really pushing hard on the idea of natural gas vehicles. And if you look at it quickly, it looks like it makes a lot of sense. You basically, what is it, one third the cost of um, oil based fuels? Um, they pollute less, and the cars sort of drive in the same way. Uh, but we don't see it happening. Um, you've, you've looked at it for Walmart, and I guess what you're saying is you've looked at it, but it doesn't seem to be something you're moving forward with as well, a They're still vehicle. testing it. I, I don't think they're, they're ready to divulge the, the final results, but I know that the, they've definitely still got some concerns around it. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, where, where it tends to work, and it's been demonstrated in other countries as well, is in densely populated areas with, with mm -hmm. fleets, particularly metro transport and shuttle buses and that sort of thing. So that, that's, that's, that's perfectly viable. Where it becomes difficult is if you take a continent or a country the size of ours and try to put out infrastructure there, then that's a little bit of a challenge. So then the answer to that is, is people are coming back and talking about a slow full technology in the house. Which, which then suggests you know, you, you've got to have regulations in place as well around that to, to demonstrate that that is safe to do. And I think the Department of Energy, in fact, not think, the Department of Energy just put out something saying, well, um, and I haven't read the whole thing, it's just a synopsis, that you're more likely to get struck by lightning than to have an explosion in the garage. But you know, as Mark Twain, swear, as Mark Twain, <laughs> Twain said, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, wicked in their order of naming. <laughs> And so the key issue here is how many people go for a walk when there's a thunderstorm and there's lightning? So, you know, the statistics are going to be low because most people are inside. So I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a challenge there with doing it. Um, but, but, but if maybe, you look at... Maybe the perspective I'd like to offer just is, is probably a little different. I mean, we, we, we understand that there's a demand constraint, and that's, that's what's keeping prices down. So one of the things that we've been looking at just is... Um, you know, Greenspan was testifying in front of Congress, what, five, six years ago? 2004. 2004, saying uh, three things in his usual very direct manner, uh, which is usually very indirect, but he was very direct <laughs> in this case. He said, we are supply constrained, we are going to see higher prices, and we have a problem. And pretty much, I think most people agreed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the U.S. Was, was, yeah, was supply constrained, and we had huge investments, or potential investments, in terms of regas facilities to bring gas in from, you know, whether the Middle East or Qatar or right. whatever. So that's flipped in the last four years, mm -hmm. four or five years. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. And we're now talking about the potential of exporting gas. And there's one plant that they're talking about, Kitty Mat, on the West Coast. Because the, the cost of freight yeah. from the West Coast to China or Japan or Korea, wh whichever, is, is pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's how fast it's changed. The, the mm -hmm. perspective would be if we look at China and India and say one out of every three people lives there, there's an interesting uh, little data point. I mean, lots of people do these, these cuts about energy consumption converted back into barrels of oil equivalent. So the average across the world is 36 uh, barrels per year equivalent, barrels of oil equivalent. So that would be coal, gas, you know, conventional fuels. Um, so no surprise, the U.S. has 5% of the population, consumes 25% of the world's oil, so, so we're sitting at about 62 to 65 barrels uh, of oil equivalent. Where do you think China and India are as an average? I mean, it's obviously less than 36. Any uh, takers? Yeah, pretty good. I mean, the, they're about as 10, so we're 10 times so, so India is below 10, China is just yeah. above 10, and, and, and that's a very good point, but China's... Exactly, yes. right. right. I think uh, India is at 65 and China's at 100. So, so the thought process would be that even if they were to double, never mind come back to the average, even if they were to double, there's a huge amount of, of demand there for gas, for, for power mm -hmm. consumption, mm -hmm. uh, obviously for petrochemical feedstock, as well as you know, conventional fuels for cars and whatever. So, I mean, I, I don't have an answer. I'm not suggesting I have an answer here, but I'm just saying that every time we look at an immediate issue of, well, where is the demand going to come from? Could it be automobiles? Well, yeah, it could. It absolutely could. Um, you know, we're probably better, better off looking at the big picture and just thinking about where else demand might come from, and it, it's going to be very significant. Hence the big investments in places like Gorgon, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, when that comes on stream will, will be just a little less than Qatar. So, which at the moment is the biggest, biggest producer of... Okay, let, let's talk a little bit about, about infrastructure. Um, if we're going to use more natural gas, we're going to need the infrastructure um, to deliver it. So, so Sean, um, El Paso is very large in the pipeline business. Um, are you seeing big changes in... And what, are you, what is your firm doing to respond? Yeah, I think, you know, significant changes over the last 10 years and, you know, really... You know, over the last 10 years, if you look at the demand side of the equation, you really haven't seen significant demand changes. Yeah, it's been relatively flat overall. But in that same time period, we've had tens of thousands of miles of pipeline 
built in the United States. And, and a lot of that just has to do with the changing sources of supply and bringing those into the uh, interstate grid. You know, we see that continuing regardless. You know, typically you build pipeline assets, right size it for the production that's going to come online over a relatively long period of time. And, you know, that's what we continue to do with, with shale plays or any of the other unconventional resources is you continue to step change and, and put new facilities in place to meet the supply needs coming into the grid. But I think, you know, long term, a lot of the things that we've discussed here today, um, there's going to be a healthy demand increase. Yeah, it's just pace of economic recovery and, you know, exactly how long it takes to, to get back up the curve. Ultimately, electricity is, is going to continue to diversify potentially, you know, depending on what happens with GHG regulation. But, you know, I think natural gas has an excellent um, opportunity to continue to gain market share in that space, and I think it will continue. To so you're that. anticipating um, the growth in the demand for natural gas, and you're building pipelines now in that anticipation? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're predominantly building a lot of pipelines right now to move supply out of various reasons, regions. Um, you know, specifically the Rocky Mountain region and the growth engine that that's been mm -hmm. in some unconventional resources, not necessarily shale. But also you look at our pipeline assets spread throughout the country and a lot of in-corridor expansions. Yeah, as supply um, is coming into those areas and, and coming into new areas, but also just the changing mix of use. You've had industrial fall off electricity generation pick up, which requires additional infrastructure to, to manage. Okay, let, let me give you a best case scenario. Best case from the point of view of your industry, which is that we, we, we get out of the recession, um, the economy is booming in 2014, uh, we have new legislation and the legislation is going to indirectly either tax or through cap and trade or whatever you want to call it, it's going to put a price on carbon, um, which is going to make natural gas advantageous relative to coal, and um, demand for natural gas goes way up. Where are the bottlenecks? If we want to increase you know, the supply of natural gas 30 or 40 percent in the next five years, are, are you guys going to be a bottleneck in terms of pipelines, or are pipelines going to be full um, because you haven't anticipated that best case scenario? Or I, I think it's going, to, it's going to take certainly a ramp up in time. I, I think you know, pipelines are going to sign up or get uh, contracts to underwrite expansions, you know, again, 10-year contracts, and they're not built on spec. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take that demand pull in order for the, the um, physical capability to be, be put in the ground. So in a sense, this legislative um, bottleneck in the legislature, at least, is causing firms like El Paso to sort of wait, um, because you can't build a pipeline now thinking that we're going to have carbon legislation and then the carbon legislation doesn't come through and you're kind of not in, you've got empty pipelines. So yeah. that's causing you to wait. It's really causing the end users to wait. You know, right. The, the power generation utilities and, and mm -hmm. other players in that space, you know, they've, they've got to wait and see what happens. And, and each one in each region is different. You know, as you look at you know, how much coal they may have in their, their total generating fuel mix, you know, specifically as you trend towards the southeast, it's a much more significant piece of their overall generation portfolio. So as we see things move forward, you could have a, a, a very large infrastructure requirement in the southeastern United States associated with that legislation if the move away from coal to natural gas. Okay. Okay. I'm going to move to Mary Ann and, and um, talk about politics for just a second okay. now that we've reached that topic. And um, I guess this is something that you're probably keenly aware of what's going on in Congress, um, cap and trade versus tax legislation, um, coal versus natural gas for, for generation. Is politics a, a real big issue here? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, um, um, I think uh, the way somebody explained it to me is that the, the logical answer to a low carbon future is, uh, is natural gas, but um, politics is not logical, right? There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of dynamics and things change once you get into the vagaries of, of political brokering of, um, of issues like this associated with energy. So um, I think as we've heard through the panel and um, other discussion in general, natural gas, because it's lower GHG, lower water, lower SOX, lower NOx, lower land use, all kinds of things like that, it should be the clear indicative winner. 
Um, but the, um, the, the hypothetical you laid out in your previous question ha uh, made an assumption that, and all, so no matter what, if you put a price on carbon, natural gas wins. And something um, that we talked about when, when we were um, preparing for this panel is that what we have found in Washington as the policies have actually been put in place is actually the needle has been thread in such a way that the one very clear loser in the carbon policy debate has been natural gas. Um, because the coal industry and so far the paradigms that have been proposed have done relatively well. They've gotten um, benefits provided to them that will allow them to be able to continue to to presumably to be able to continue to produce power and the renewable industry also has gotten a lot of benefits and the effect has been backing out natural gas. Okay, now I can understand why renewables would get a lot of subsidies from Washington. Okay. Um, I guess the question is why have you been outflanked by the coal industry? Why have we been outflanked by the coal industry? <laughs> because they're big um, and we're organized. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think that the coal industry has always been the highest GHG per BTU energy source. Sure. So for decades since carbon policy has begun to build its tractions in the 80s and the 90s, coal always knew that they were going to be the large elephant in the room, and they have been organized for the past 10, 10 15, 20 years. Um, towards an effort uh, or organized to be able to have their interests protected. And then in Washington, their representation between coal states and utilities that rely heavily on coal, for instance, southeastern states, um, they have more numbers than the number of representatives that you have for the other energy sources, including natural gas, but I think nuclear also suffers from that in a similar way. Okay. Um, one last question um, for you, Miriam. Regulatory hurdles. You probably worry about that quite a bit. Other regulatory issues that we should be thinking about? Um, there are a few. Um, I think one of them is uh, water policies. There is, um, and there's two areas of water policies where there's a lot of concern. One of them deals with um, this shale phenomenon, this um, shale gas phenomenon, and pretty much most of our unconventional shale phenomenon, so more than half of the natural gas that's produced here in this country, um, relies on a production technique called hydraulic fracturing. And I'm not sure what the range of familiarity is with that production technique is in this room, but it's basically a process where they use um, fluids and a lot of pressure to put cracks in the rocks so that the, so that the resource will flow up more naturally. Um, there's been uh, a lot of um, and this is a process that's been used for 60 years, time-tested, no um, confirmed cases of a situation where hydraulic fracturing has compromised water sources, but there's been a lot of questions raised by some groups, especially NGO groups, um, saying that um, it needs to be regulated at the federal level mm -hmm. and regulated in a way, uh, in the same way that they regulate when you're trying to dispose of something underground, so a lot more cost associated with it. So that's a big regulatory space where there's concern. Um, what to do with the produced water is another regulatory space where there's concern. And um, I guess another area um, that deals more at the utility level is uh, uh, the ability to enter into long-term contracts and hedge and those sorts of things with natural gas and be able to handle uh, uh, for utilities to be able to absorb volatility that naturally comes, you can't fight it. A commodity is a commodity. It's got volatility and it's going to have price spikes and not um, be limited in what they can do regulatorily with their contracts. But um, we can offer long-term contracts with coal. Why can't we offer long-term contracts with gas? To buy gas? Yeah. You know, that's a very good question. There has been, uh, there is just generally a resistance between the end user and the producer to enter into these contracts. That's historically has been there. And it's the great um, bottleneck, I think, besides politics on more natural gas being more of our energy future. And I think it's a place where there needs to be an understanding that even though that, that this shale gas phenomenon is a game changer and um, it changes um, not just supply demand dynamics, but it also changes potentially it's a contributor to changing volatility.
Yeah, I would expect less volatility, just less because volatility. just because it's in some sense it's more similar to coal in the way it's produced. Right, it's more like manufacturing. Yes, it's more like yes. manufacturing. Yeah, um, Chad. Well, I actually wanted to amplify uh, to what Marianne just said. Um, coal is in a very unusual situation where, except for the East Coast, there are actually virtually no coal exports from the United States, and mo and almost all coal is burned in electrical power stations. And so coal contracts have been very stable and coal price in the US has been very low. Mm -hmm. You know, Wyoming coal, I haven't checked it recently, but you know, a year ago it was probably 29 bucks per ton. If you go, you know, towards China, like to the Newcastle coal in Australia, that can run you 150 and there were times over $200 per, per ton on the spot market. So my joke is that if the Powder River people figured out a way of building a railroad line to Seattle, they would quadruple the price of their coal <laughs> and natural gas would be in. Um, so <coughs> natural gas, there's a cultural problem where people don't want to see natural gas as a highly regulated um, commodity. But as a counter argument, I would venture to say that the same natural gas is highly regulated in Europe and in Asia and it delivers prices about which our producers can only dream. And in addition, the demand for this gas is consistently higher because people know what the price will be, they accept the high price, and they still go for the gas. Many people here, and I was approached by, by someone very, very important in the steel industry who wanted to open a very large production facility of high-grade steel on the East Coast and he just basically told me, you know what, we're willing to generate 2,000 of good American jobs. We can't do that because we cannot sign a contract for natural gas for 10 years. Everybody's kind of glazing over when we talk to them about this. And he says, I can go to Qatar, I can go to Norway, I can go to Russia, I can go to Trinidad, and I can sign the contract. Well, guess where our plant is going? Okay, so, so I think there would be, uh, again, there would be a benefit of having a little bit more stability. Okay, I'm, we don't have Rob Jones here, but he's in, he was here last night, and he's in charge of commodities with Merrill Lynch, and I can be almost certain that Rob Jones would be willing to sign a 10-year contract on natural gas. Well, he um, hasn't. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think a big issue has been credit, the risk of credit yeah. like that. Right. I remember, uh, it was a little bit over 10 years ago, I asked people at Enron, will you sign a 10-year contract for natural gas? And they said, sure, not, not a problem. And then someone else said, you know, ask them at what price. Um, so it, it's not a problem getting the long-term contracts. Um, there's a question in terms of default risk that people worry about. And then, of course, what the price is going to be. Um, the, the other thing that I didn't understand about this industry was we had these sort of middlemen, the Enrons, the Dynergies, and so on, and they would go to a producer of natural gas and write a long-term contract, and then they'd go to an end user and write a long-term contract, and um, the producers would kind of find it annoying that Enron was in the middle of making money, um, but for some reason, they liked having them in the middle in terms of writing that long-term contract, something that I'm not sure I understand. Um, can we open it up for questions in the audience in case any of you guys have any questions? Uh, I'd like to make a statement. Uh, if you're a utility business in Texas today, you can't get a long term contract for coal. They, the, this is being phased out all over the country. Uh, I mean, it's very difficult. It used to be that, that everyone had some of uh, transportation, which is the biggest cost, and a coal contract. They no longer. These are all annual contracts. That's the, now the term. So you aren't, you aren't seeing 10-year contracts for coal at all? If you're a large, let's say the city of Austin wants to go out and get a coal contract, they, they can't get it at the price that they would accept. And that's true for almost every utility. Interesting. Contract. And what's the reason for that? Uh, part of it is the, the, the rail transportation. Captive shipper. Mm -hmm. The rail transportation has found that it's much more profitable
So, so Sean, you, you write very long-term contracts on your pipeline, don't you? We do. We do. Yeah, I think one of the differences, though, is, too, I mean, we, we're very capital-intensive. Right. When we, when we put the infrastructure on the ground. We're regulated by FERC, so we have a set, you know, return that we're going to get on our assets. And so there's a lot of stability, you know, as you look at our side of the business. And so I think, you know, to the extent you do see some longer-term contracts for gas procurement, like you were mentioning, I bet a lot of those were index-based deals right. that still had a lot of float associated with, with the price. Right. Yeah, the contracts that you write with, say, to, with producers in order to move the gas to market, right. uh, you have some sort of contextual right to take over some of the reserves or something, should something happen with that financial. You know, typically what, what the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission allows is in existing transport capacity, you have a very you know, small amount of, of demand charge uh, you know, that you can actually cover. And it's typically around three months of, of coverage only. For new infrastructure that you're building, there's a little bit more leniency to go after a couple years of, of demand charges around that, around that level. But in terms of actually going in and, and taking over some reserves, FERC hasn't allowed us to do that. Um, Ron? Well, for comment and a question on this issue of long term contracts for, for gas, I com comment is well, since this uh, market arose for a short while uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, you had two things happening. You had on the supply side uh, aggregations by the intermediary, as you described, Sharon, who used volumetric production payments and techniques and bundled and allowed you to go beyond one producer taking the risk of being able to deliver the gas they committed out in a long period of time. I think that's needed. But the other thing you had were independent power producers who could sell the grid at a fixed price for 20 years and commit, therefore, to a fixed price for 20 years on their supply contract with gas. And that's gone. And, and I'm wondering if, uh, I, I pose this to Greg, uh, as a big consumer uh, on behalf of Walmart, uh, would you as a large consumer be willing to uh, buy a 20-year fixed price supply of this commodity? Or do you see anyone else who would be willing to? Because I think that's one of the problems that you don't see the stability of a contract period any longer in gas. Okay. Uh, historically, Walmart's been very reluctant to enter into longer-term contracts. I mean, I think the, uh, the thinking was that over a longer period of time, you'll always achieve the best price. At, at some kind of market-based uh, price. So even with our uh, renewable deals that we've done, I mean, we've really shortened uh, the window to, to what the uh, suppliers of, of solar and, and wind and, and uh, the fuel cells wanted uh, to, you know, 10-year range contracts versus 20 that they were looking for and uh, managed to put the risk uh, on uh, the supplier as, as well rather than taking it in-house. So. Long-term contracts, not for Walmart. Would it be fair to say that consumers like yourself don't view it? I mean, uh, fuel and electricity costs is part of the business, but you're not in the business of speculating on that type of yeah. that type of risk. So you're not going to do it. It's it's a large cost force, um, uh, probably our second largest operating cost, but it's not part of the core business, or at least it's not perceived to be uh, part of the core business. So. Um, yeah, they're just risk adverse and, and not going to get into that. I, I bring that back to the panel, then if that might not contradict what was said earlier, because if there are others who sure that you and I think they do, then the producers have to bet on the timing of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And I think these conventional wells, which have a 70 or 80 percent decline rate after the first year, have the potential, therefore, for far more volatility in gas prices, not less. Yes, there's an inventory to uh, develop a lot more, but uh, you potentially have far greater volatility because of the inability to contract through an investment return cycle. I'm curious if anybody agrees with that. Go ahead, Well, I don't know if I agree. this is a very interesting question, uh, and I think it's very difficult to answer it uh, in vacuum because it is, has also to be posed in a different context. We are used to the idea of the energy unconstrained world where in fact there is ample energy flowing among the continents and in the end everybody gets enough. Now suppose for a second that that is no longer true or it ceases to be true as we're sitting here. Well, that fact alone 
will add greatly to instability of prices of pretty much anything. You know, people were talking about great speculation about of oil on oil price uh, prior to the uh, Olympic mm -hmm. Olympic Games in China, and now mm -hmm. it turns out that a large part of the speculation was the order of the Chinese government to hoard oil at any cost. And there were also instances where the Chinese were buying coal, I'm told one ship at 300 bucks per ton, because they were ordered we're gonna have enough energy to produce electricity and service the Olympics. So that was done in the world which had no idea that energy is constrained. Now think of the fact if China and India have more cars and are more dependent on the energy market in the world, what's gonna happen now with the speculation and the short-term contracts for coal. So all of it, to me, brings a, a picture of more instability, not because of the fast declining natural gas wells, which is an element of it, but because the energy becomes constrained and our new energy sources deliver energy at lower and lower rates. See, this is something that I have to make very, very clear to the sort of lay audience. There is plenty of fossil energy worldwide. There is so much of it that, that I don't even bother to talk about it. However, the rate at which we can produce it be, may become less and less because it's in faraway places, it's in very difficult formation, and it's just difficult to make it, and then there is the question of water, which hasn't been quite uh, fairly mentioned here. And so, with all of that, I think that there will be more plan price volatility rather than less. I guess we had a different take because at the end of the day, price and volatility of price, one of the most fundamental components of that is supply and demand. And with, with shale gas and unconventionals changing the dynamic on the amount of supply, you're automatically going to have a dampening effect because supply and demand won't be so tight. Remember, we're talking about gas and not oil, which oil at that time with the Olympics would had a much tighter um, supply-demand dynamic. On top of that, though, super on top, superimposed on top of that, you have a few other things that change the dynamic from the history of natural gas as we've known them before. One of them is storage. And to give you a good example of that, I think we've added one TCF of natural gas storage since 05, 06. And to help appreciate the difference that makes, we had one of the coldest winters we've ever had in this year, and you didn't see natural gas hardly tremor at all. So that also helps to dampen the volatility. And then the third piece of it, I think, is LNG. And you know, at one time, LNG was going to be the only relief valve. But now with, I think we have uh, nine, I forget exactly how many um, LNG terminals we have here now uh, permitted here in the US. No, it's more than nine, 16. Um, anyway, the point is, is LNG then provides you yet another dampener to be able to offset or the risk of volatility. And I, it is one reason why there is this constant drumbeat from Washington, though, this concern about there being um, some concern about scarcity of resources, that there is a political threat to our resource. As you said, we have plenty of fossil fuels. I, we definitely don't subscribe to the idea that we're running out anytime soon. But there is political risk associated. But when you're producing that resource here in North America where you don't have that political risk and natural gas is enjoying that, um, then those sorts of concerns start to drift away. It's important to distinguish the, the discussion between those security concerns that you have with oil that you're getting from places where you might have those concerns as opposed to natural gas that we have the opportunity to produce here. I find, I, it, we, yeah, I find it interesting that you say that there's no political risk here. I've talked to a number of people in the industry, and I ask them, where, where in the world do you think the political risk is the highest? And they say, by far, California. <laughs> and California is not our largest producing state either, right? <laughs> it's a different type of risk. Right. California also, right? Nancy Pelosi too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Clark. Yep. a lot less in the south and the north. And somebody was giving a presentation the other day said, Ken Morgan just built this little over 
a bunch of pipelines from west yep. to east. And now if you draw a line from the United States north to south, most of your marginal gas production is coming on to Haynesville, Marcellus, and all this LNG, which may tilt the U.S., where you have the big pipeline headed from west to east that's actually going into a lower price mm -hmm. environment. So what, what are your comments about that? How does it impact Tennessee and some of your pipelines? Yeah, I think you know the the Rex pipeline was really built as, as a you know an outlet for the growth engine in the Rockies. You know the producers largely underwrote that project, and I think what it does is it gives a lot of market optionality. It gives market optionality into the Northeast, gives it into the Upper Midwest, and, and those producers now have additional outlets. You know, with the Ruby pipeline being built also by El Paso, they'll also be able to access the West Coast and the Pacific Northwest. So really what, what's happened is, is very similar to what you just said. You've had a replumbing, basically, where growing sources of supply now can reach a variety of different markets. And, and I think that you know, as you look at El Paso's assets, we're regionally diverse, so we can take advantage of increases in supply or demand in a variety of different areas. So I think you know, for us overall, you know, we're in a good position. We've participated in a lot of those expansions. Are you worried at all? Contracts. Sure. The markets up there will get more short term because you see all this gas being developed up there and they're you know, up in that region. They can, they can buy it for, I mean, if the gas prices collapse obviously between the north and the south. Why would somebody pay a dollar to transport gas from the south to the north? I think it's just, you know, again, the option of a variety of supply sources and do they want that optionality? Yeah, and I think that, you know, each individual shipper will have a different take on it. Uh, I think we feel pretty, pretty bullish that they're going to continue, a lot of the LDCs are going to continue to want that optionality. What would that mean you would buy storage of the Northeast versus would that be is that what it is? Yeah, I think, you know, I think storage is an important picture. It's a point, you know, a very important part of the overall picture. You know, we talk about volatility and really focusing on volatility and price in the earlier discussion. But, you know, one of the significant changes with, you know, additional gas fire generation peaking units is physical volatility. And that takes pipeline capacity and pipeline storage. You know, and pipeline really isn't, isn't built with, you know, molecules trans, you know, being transported, uh, you know, over, you know, what, 20 miles an hour a day or something like that and you know the response to handle electric power generation coming on very swiftly either you know to, to supplement alternative um, sources or whatever is it's very taxing on the assets so 